Happy Friday, everybody. Um, welcome to our third lecture of our 2015 lecture series, uh, Balanced Living Lecture Series. As people know who have been here before, these lectures are put on by the Bar Association's Health and Wellbeing Committee. The committee was started in 2012 to address issues of anxiety, stress, depression, work-life balance. We have a monthly column in the uh, Bar Association Journal called uh, Balanced Living, and we do a lecture series four times a year. Uh, our next lecture will be on November 6th, which uh, will be on meditation. And uh, we are also doing a CLE, for those of you interested, on October the 26th, which is about handling clients with uh, mental health issues. That will be done at the Interact for Health site, um, and we're not sure of the time yet, whether it will be morning or afternoon. Um, our, com our committee is proudly sponsored for these events by the Cincinnati Bar Foundation. Particularly, I would uh, like to mention the Ken Jamison Health and Wellbeing Fund, which was started by the widow of uh, Ken um, after his um, suicide to support the work of the committee. If you are going to be giving to the Bar Foundation this year, I would ask that you consider giving your donation as targeted toward that fund. We're trying to reach a goal so that these programs can continue into the future. I um, am glad today about today's topic, which is stress. And we all have it. Everyone has stress. It can be both good and bad, and sometimes it gets a pretty bad rap. And our, our speaker today is going to be introduced by Jim Bogan. But before we begin, I just want to share a quote that I found to give to him today. It says, our greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. And that's by philosopher and psychologist William James. And hopefully our speaker will give us some hints on how to do that and how to live a stress-managed life instead of a stress-free life. Thank you, Tabitha. Is she, Tab, Tabitha already introduced me. When you see me in the bar directory as a very eloquently James F. Bogan attorney at law. I'm in, I'm in solo practice, and I focus on criminal DUI and all that good stuff. But here's how I know Jeff. We both swam for University of Cincinnati at different times. I, was announce, I announced at the home meets in the last few years, and he started officiating at them. And that's how we met. And I also had the distinction of seeing Jeff race in the alumni meet, what was that, two years ago? He had a very recent uh, NCAA champion in his heat. And, uh, but Jeff had a very solid swim. <laughs> but Jeff is an executive coach. He's also a pastor in the Lebanon area. And he does group and one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. And we're very glad to have him here. But. Um, before we get started, we're going to do a drawing. I'm going to keep this neutral. <laughs> I'm not looking. Jennifer Anstat. I love that you have to be here. <laughs> That's a good question. Tabitha. <laughs> Okay. Jan Hatcher. Yes, you did, Jan. Would you like to accept your prize? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, ki I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway, now let's uh, have Jeff. Everybody give Je Mr. Raker a hand, Jeff Raker a hand. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so, uh, we'll, we'll, Jan, we'll, we'll connect afterwards. Uh, so, you, uh, you uh, want a, uh, a one-hour free coaching session. So, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see where it goes. So, uh, so uh, James is right. I did uh, swim in that alumni meet, and uh, I am proud to say I won my age group uh, because uh, four lanes over was Josh Schneider, uh, who two years earlier was the 50 freestyle NC2A champion. He's also ranked about sixth in the world at the moment. Uh, and uh, I, uh, as I was doing my third turn on the 100 freestyle, he was finishing. 
just to give you an idea of where that is. So it is, uh, it is an honor to be here with you today. Uh, thanks for the, the kind introduction. Uh, I, have, uh, I have been coaching people for over 25 years. Uh, as a pastor, uh, I've helped people find their uh, purpose uh, and uh, God created purpose and to pursue that in life. As a swim official, uh, I've helped people fine tune their habits. Uh, I'm uh, privileged to be one of four starters, so we get to say the take your mark thing, uh, four starters that can represent the United States internationally. Uh, and so I've been privileged to be uh, most recently in Doha, Qatar, uh, and uh, the year before that in Kazan, Russia. Uh, so we'll see if uh, any other doors open after that. As an executive coach, uh, I've enjoyed helping leaders remove the lid of their weaknesses to make changes in their behaviors to get that get in the way of being better leaders. We all know that our strengths will take us so far, but our weaknesses will eventually put a lid on us. And executive coaches come in and help with that. So today we're just going to scratch the surface of some points of executive coaching related to stress in our lives, in your lives as lawyers. Stress and, and pressure are not unique to the legal profession, but I think there are some uniquenesses in the legal profession that are, uh, are, are, are or can be difficult. So what happens? You've got some, some notes you can take notes on, and we'll get to a couple of the slides that are in your notes here in a little bit. Uh, lawyers in stress. Uh, stress in all of our lives leads to physical problems, a lowered immune system, lack of sleep, uh, premature aging, uh, and disease, and even death. Um, it's said, statistically, one half of lawyers would not recommend the profession to their children. That says something. More time at the office means less time at home. We all know that. But in practicality, how do we live it out? Alcohol abuse in the legal profession is 5 to 8 percent above average in the nation. Substance abuse factors in 75 percent of disciplinary complaints. Lawyers top the charts of professions that deal with depression. Whew. Heavy stuff, but that's what the statistics tell us. Now, stress and pressure can come from a lot of different places. Here's some places I found it. Values conflicts. Uh, we have different values with people, not right or wrong necessarily, just different. And it creates stress and pressure. Different communication styles. This is where I really become the expert uh, in my executive coaching. Blocked or broken dreams and goals bring stress and pressure in our lives. What about the need to be right? <laughs> the need to be right creates stress and pressure in people's lives. I've got to prove you're wrong because I have to prove I'm right. How would you fill in the blank? The need to be seen as competent, the best, whatever it is, can certainly bring stress into our lives. What about the need to avoid failure? It's huge stressor. Lack of boundaries, ownership issues. What are you responsible for? What are you not responsible for? In executive coaching, we talk about accountability. What am I accountable for? Who am I accountable to? And who am I accountable for? If we get that straight, there's a whole lot less stress in our lives. When you quit going through other people's kitchen drawers and they quit going through yours, <laughs> it creates less stress. What is it that, that causes pressure, your pressure, to rise? What about taking things personally? Here's an interesting one. Now, uh, Dimini is going to help me here a little bit. Many of you picked up a uh, Q-tip, or I passed one out to you, and you wondered why that was out there. This Q-tip is one of my, uh, my best tools, because as a coach, I have tools, 
and I act as a guide, and I ask great questions, and we make a climb up to your leadership peak together. This Q-tip is great. What do you think it stands for? Quit taking it personally. So many of us create stress in our lives because we believe that the people in whom we have conflict with woke up that morning with the pure intention to make our lives difficult. And it also goes with the other things in the list, right? I have to prove that I'm right. I have to do this. I have to do that. And we create stress and pressure. This is this when I was coached by an executive coach. This became one of my best things, reminders. So I keep, I, I keep it in my pocket. I want to encourage you to, to do that. Keep it in your pocket and remind yourself that people don't wake up thinking, how can they make your life difficult today? Now, I did think in the legal profession, eh, if you're on opposite sides of the courtroom there, <laughs> maybe they are trying to make it a little difficult. And I get that, but it's not personal. It's not personal. It's a great little tool to just help remind us. What causes pressure to grow in your life? What is it that, that gets you on that list we looked at? Maybe it's something else. What's your greatest stressor in life? That's actually one of the questions that I ask in a first session with a coaching client. We talk about what's your greatest stressor in your job, in your life. It creates a great conversation. Here's what I've learned over the years. If you understand yourself and you understand others, you'll be able to move through most stressful circumstances with little negative effect. There's still gonna be stress and there's still gonna be some effect but you can pretty much avoid the negative pieces if you understand yourself and you understand others. If you do not understand others, but you do know yourself, you'll avoid some stressors while being drawn into others. But if you do not understand yourself nor others, I believe you're doomed to spend most of your life in stress from miscommunication. Understanding yourself and understanding others is foundational to what I do as an executive coach. In my particular process of coaching, here's what I use. Now, we call it impact on business. Positive skills plus positive behavior leads to positive impact on business. Well, that makes sense. I don't deal with the skills. I'm the expert in the behaviors when added to them. We don't have to go very far or look very long for some examples of great skills, bad behavior leads to negative impact. Which one do you want to choose? Because in each of these sports examples, it's not the skills that are the problem. It's the behavior that surrounds the skills. And bad, poor, negative behavior will cancel out great skills. And I don't care if you're an athlete, a lawyer, a pastor, you, you name it. Great skills, bad behavior, poor behavior, unwise behavior will have a negative impact. Politicians, CEOs, accountants, lawyers, we're all in the same boat because we're human beings. Executive coaching brings about behavior change that creates a positive impact on business. I've watched it happen and, and it is just wonderful to see when the light bulb comes on and, they, and people make the changes that they need to make. So one of the tools that I use in my coaching business is called the DISC profile. Is anybody familiar with that? Okay, there's a few of you. Uh, DISC, four letters, D-I-S-C, it's usually a lowercase i. 
uh, is four different profiles of behavior communication. It's not a personality profile like Myers-Briggs. Uh, it is a behavioral profile. Personality doesn't change. Behavior can change. And that's why we use the DISC. If you underst understanding your DISC profile gives you the opportunity to create more win-win relationships. And we all want those in our lives. So uh, here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, well, let, let me show one more. Understanding yourself equals the ability to control yourself. Understanding others equals the ability to communicate with others. And we all have to do that. And we all have to do it better. So the online DISC assessment takes 20 minutes, costs about $70. We don't have time for that today. Uh, so I'm going to give you a, about a three-minute DISC. Uh, assessment and, uh, and then I'm going to ask you to start using your notes and writing some things down and, and uh, some of you when we go through this will say well I, it depends what I would choose depending on the circumstance we're all a blend of these things what I'm gonna do in three minutes you know is, is gonna have some of you saying well I'm sort of that and I'm sort of that okay try to try to figure out which are you more of uh, if that uh, if that makes sense so are you more fast-paced and outspoken or more cautious and reflective? Let me define them a little bit for you. Uh, do you tend to maybe talk fast? Uh, maybe you tend to answer everything and join every conversation? Or are you a little more, eh, I wonder if I need to respond. I wonder if I need to be in this conversation. You're a little more cautious. You're a little, little, little more reflective on things. Uh, the, the first one will make a decision and then make it the right decision. <laughs> the, the second one will wait to make a decision. A little more reflective. The first one, their motto is ready, fire, aim. And the other one is ready, aim, aim. Yeah, let's aim again. Uh, let's aim one more time. And they might fire. So pick one, pick one, circle it, write it down. Now here's the second choice. Are you more questioning and skeptical or accepting and warm? Now, it doesn't mean the questioning and, accept and, and, and skeptical aren't warm people, but here, let me define it for us. Are, are you one who, when a new idea comes your way, you're kind of like, I'm not so sure that's going to work. That's your first response. Or here's the five ways this is not going to work. <laughs> you might verbalize it, you might not. Or new idea comes your way and you're like, oh, this could be fun. Let's try it. Let's give it a, let's give it a try. Let's, let's, let's go do it. Sure. Or maybe it's not quite as enthusiastic, but you're sort of like, well, if everybody else is going to do it, then uh, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll follow along. I, I, I can do that. Um, the first one uh, tends to have uh, maybe a little bit, a little bit of a, a smaller network of people, whereas the accepting and warm has a large network of people. They've never met a stranger. They can also be the people who, if they have to walk from one room in their house through a room to a third room, they may never make it to the third room because a shiny thing may distract them. <laughs> And we all know people in our lives who are that way. They're the life of the party. They're wonderful and fun, and long-range planning is five minutes. That's just sort of who they are. All right, so you've made two choices, right? Okay, fast-paced or cautious, questioning or accepting. Now, on one of your slides are, are my four people of the disc. And, um, and what I want you to do is this. You're going to circle a letter. If you chose fast-paced and questioning, okay, top and left, I want you to circle the D, okay? If you chose fast-paced and questioning, circle the D. You see how this is going to work, right? You should have this slide in here. If you chose fast-paced and welcoming, okay, top and right, circle the I. Okay, everybody follow me? We good? Ask a question if you don't. 
they, oh, is it hard to see? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it just didn't quite come out. So, uh, so top left is the D. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Top left is the D. Top right is the I. Fast paced, okay? Fast paced and questioning is top left on your circle. Fast paced and welcoming is top right on your circle. D, I, so you might write those letters down. Cautious and welcoming, so bottom and right. First choice was on the bottom, second choice is on the right. The lower right, which is the S. And then obviously cautious and questioning. The bottom one for your first choice, the left one for your second choice is the C in the bottom left. So D-I-S-C from top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. Thanks for that question. I appreciate the help. See, see what happens in our communication? If I just keep going and nobody asks a question, I think communication has happened. <laughs> It hasn't, if we're not on the same page. Awesome, thank you. So everybody got a letter? Who, who chose a D? Raise your hand. All right, there's a few of you. Who chose an I? Ah, fascinating. What about the C? Yep. And what about the S? Awesome. All right. It's probably good that a lawyer is an I because they like people. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's right. The eyes are the fun group uh, of uh, of people when I'm doing a uh, doing a team training. So DISC basically just teaches us that different people have different preferences in the way they think, in the way they feel, and in the way they instinctively behave. And these things can shift and change through training, through coaching, and through the application of some self discipline. So let's. Uh, for, for instance, <laughs> the old uh, half full, half empty, right? Different people will gravitate to different observations. Now what's really irritating is typically the C's, the C people, who like to be right and exact and, and, and they're very cautious about when they, when they move forward, they tend to look at it this way. Or they might actually say, uh, the glass is not the same at the bottom and the top, so if you only fill it supposedly half with water, it's half of nothing because the top's bigger than the bottom. <laughs> and the eyes really could care less about that. <laughs> it's just, it's, well, there's water there. What does it matter? We all have different preferences. So let me, we are just scratching the surface. Let me give you a couple things. Where are my D's again? Where, where are the people who are D's? We just have a few of you in the, in the room. Here's where a D is stressed. When you can't achieve your goals, when people get in your way, and they move slowly or they make a lot of small talk. D's don't like to make small talk. They want to get things done. So if they walk by your office down the hall and they don't say hi to you, don't take it personally. Grab your Q-tip. It's okay. They're just moving, right? D's don't like people taking advantage of them. Because they, like they like to win. They like to, they're very competitive by nature. Or when you have to deal with a wall of bureaucracy. <laughs> you gotta deal with red tape. Ugh. Don't give them so many rules, just, just let them go. Let them get moving. What does a D do? They get into everybody else's business they get a little more blunt and sarcastic. They get mean. They can get mean. They overrule and steamroll people. And if they're part of a team, they withdraw. By the way, you can, uh, I'm noticing some writing and I appreciate that and that's great. If you want to email me, I will send you a link to the Dropbox on this uh, so that you can have it. Uh, but you may still want to take a few notes as well. Uh, Here's what I would tell D's. Step back, slow down, and reevaluate your priorities. Think about the big picture before responding. Because D's will want to just jump right in there and fix it. Take a deep breath. What about the eyes? Where's our fun? We've got a lot of fun people. 
man, this is awesome. Uh, when others dampen your optimism and enthusiasm, when others frown when you're smiling, and you smile a lot, because life is fun. When others don't let you speak up, eyes love to interact, and they do it a lot with words. Don't put an eye in a corner office with no windows. Oh, it's bad. When someone takes away your phone and your colleagues. It, it's stressful because you thrive on people. Here's what, a, here's what an eye does. They act impulsively. They make decisions solely on gut feelings. They become disorganized. <laughs> now, eyes don't tend to be super organized anyways, but wow, watch an eye get stressed and they become very disorganized. So if you know people on your team who are eyes and they become disorganized, you know they're under stress. You can help them. If you know yourself and you know others, guess what? You can communicate better. They have difficulty estimating the time needed for tasks. It takes eyes longer to accomplish things because they love talking to people. And they don't always keep their eye on the end product, right? Yeah, that's the way it happens. So here's what I would say to eyes. Focus on the problem, assume responsibility, and be accountable for a solution. Oh my word, I may have just made some eyes a little stressed. Um, but eyes need to slow down. Remember, they're fast-paced, D's and I's. That was the top choice, fast-paced. Focus on the problem. Assume responsibility. I have, a, I have three children. My middle child is, a, is an I. Oh, my word. She's been fun. <laughs> um, as a teenager, add the hormones to a high I, and she is just off the wall. Life of the party. Wonderful, wonderful young lady, incredibly creative. And I have no idea how her brain works. It's just, it's just different. Love her to death. Then I have a high D as my oldest. And then I have one who's a D and a C together. So, wonderful, uh, wonderful combination. How about our S's? S's? All right, the S's are steady. Best team players around, you can count on an S. They say they're gonna do something, they're gonna do it. They won't necessarily be very bold and, and, and you know, out there, but they'll just work quietly behind the scenes, that's just fine. And part of the reason they do that is they're the peacekeepers. They don't like conflict at all. The D's and the I's sometimes create conflict. <laughs> we, just, we just thrive on it. The S's, when rules and processes keep changing, S's get stressed. They like to know what to do, how to do it, how you want it done, what's the finished project, let me do it, right? <laughs> yep. When their loyalty is questioned, S's will get stressed. Don't question their loyalty because they are the most loyal people. A actually, most of the population are S's. So, when an S is given an expectation without clear priorities, they get stressed. Because S's want to know how you want it done. Clear expectations. In the research of executive coaching and the uh, process that I use called Sherpa coaching. Uh, the re our research has shown that leaders have two issues that are predominant across the board for leaders. One is setting clear expectations. We're, we're, we're just not very good at it. None of us. The other one is accountability. And so in my coaching process, those are two that everybody gets. But an S especially. Here's how I would like it done. Here's when I would like it done. Here's what I would like it to look like because they want to meet that. And then they'll go do it. When an S feels rushed, <laughs> don't make an S. Make a, just a spot decision. Got to give them some time. They'll come through. They'll do it. 
Here's what, a stra here's what an S does. They just go back to doing things the way they've always been done. <laughs> if you're trying to throw something new at them and they don't understand. And, if, and here's something important. When you, if you're part of a team and you have an S on your team, when you end a meeting, you'll say, does anybody have any questions about what they are supposed to do? The S will not ask any questions. But it doesn't mean they understand it all. So you've got to go to the S afterwards, and you've got to say, so talk to me after you process this a little bit, and I want to really make sure that you understand where you are. Now, an S can learn to ask questions, because there's some things that get in the way of that. That's what a coach is there for. An S has trouble juggling multiple tasks when they get stressed, because they want to do it well. When they need full information to feel comfortable. Got to give, a, gotta give a, a, an S time and let them ask questions. When an S is stressed, they'll just simply wait for orders or direction before beginning a task. They just, they just I don't know what I'm supposed to do, so I'm not even going to try. That's what an S will do. Now, interesting, those of you who are Ds, top left, S is bottom right, priority and pace conflicts. <laughs> D's and S's have the hardest time understanding each other. And so do I's and C's. Key point for an S, move a little faster. <laughs> Share what you're feeling and thinking. Then actually make decisions. S's don't like to make decisions. They, they, they respond well to being told, here's what I'd like you to do. Resist the urge to simply avoid conflict. S's S's do not like conflict at all. Help them. Not learn to love it, but learn to work through it because we all have conflicts in our lives. Now what about a C? Where's the C's? We got a few of those. All right, yep. When you don't have time to process before making a decision, it causes stress. You like to be able to, pro remember ready, aim, 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 aim. <laughs> When your work is criticized, mm, because S's, C's like to be exact. They like to be precise. They make great CPAs in the world. When you're given lousy equipment, no upgrading. <laughs> Got to have the tools to do it if you want me to do it right and well. When you don't have time to check and double check a project before giving up on it is finished. Like to make sure it's done well. Great people to have will pepper you with a million questions. But once they've got it answered, get out of their way, because they'll do it. A C will seek more feedback and direction. They'll ask more questions when they're stressed. They won't be able to make decisions. They'll get bogged down in it. They'll resist delegated tasks. That, that C will, well, they just won't take any more on. And they could get a little snippy about it. I'm married to one of those. <laughs> and she's wonderful. They will yield their position to avoid controversy. To avoid conflict. They just don't like it. I want to solve issues in my marriage now. My wife wants to go step away for a half an hour. And in early marriage, I thought she was coming up with the ten ways to divorce me because you needed to do it now. So we had to work on that, a pace issue. Key point for a C, use available data to make a decision. Use positive self-talk. Cs can become very critical of themselves when they get stressed. Resist the urge to drag your feet and nitpick to avoid being wrong. I don't like being wrong. They like to be exact and precise. Wonderful, wonderful people to have on a team. But you've got to know who they are and how to deal with them. Remember, the opposite of ease is disease. The opposite of ease is disease. And when we don't understand ourselves and we don't understand others, it creates more stress in our lives creates more conflict. We run into even more problems. 
So what are some strategies? Now we get to the coaching part. Let me ask you a question. When are you full? And I'll give you how, to, how I, I would want you to answer this question as a client. Not busy, but rather at your best. When are you at your best? What needs to be happening in your life for you to be at your best or full? Here's what I need in my life. I need to be dating my wife of 29 years, which now involves traveling to Columbus to see the first grandchild as frequently as possible. Physical exercise has to be a part of my world. If I'm not swimming, lifting, I don't run, swimmers don't like to run. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then, then my life's not full. I have to have spiritual exercise in my life. I need to work out my physical body and my heart and soul. I need to be teaching. I love to teach. I, I teach in seminaries around the world, on, on the mission field. I, I teach in, in, in every setting I possibly can. Why well, I jumped at this chance to be, to be with you all today. I love to teach. I've got to be doing that, coaching people, teaching. And I've got to be doing something with the world of swimming and the officiating piece. I love being around that world. It's just part of what fills me. I always encourage people, find what you're passionate about and then find a way to live in that. This is what makes me full. What makes you full? What I find is that in order to manage stress in my life, if I get overly stressed, and when I finally realize it, I have to sit down with this list, and I have to go, what have I not been doing? Or has it shifted? Because this has shifted over the years. Is there, is there something missing out of this list of five things? Don't make more than five. <laughs> just, just you know, four or five. And if something's missing, then I've got to figure out a way to pull that back into my life, or I'm not going to manage life very well. When are you full? When are you full? In my longer-term profession, as a pastor, we have another way of saying this. Love your neighbor as yourself. If I don't love myself, I can't love my neighbor. The most frequent question I'm asked as a pastor is, how do you pray? Most frequent question over 27 years. How do you pray? You know, or something about prayer. And I inevitably will say, you know, I'll ask a few questions, and then and I'll say, well, you know, you should begin by praying for yourself. Oh, <gasps> well, that's selfish. I, I wouldn't do that. I, I need to pray for other people. Other people's issues are far bigger than mine. You know, some form of that answer most regularly comes out. And then I say, then please don't pray for me. Because I don't want your prayers meddling in my life until you've prayed for yourself. We can't love others until we are at our best. We can't serve others until we are at our best. It's not selfish to put yourself first. It is selfish not to spend that capacity in serving others. When are you full? When are you at your best? What are the things that must be a part of your world in order for you to be at the best for your clients, for your spouse, for your kids, for your family, for your friends and neighbors, your coworkers? When you're not at your best, you're not going to be your best, the best on the team. You're not going to give the, give the best value and input not going to happen. You're not going to serve well. It's not going to happen. 
One of the tools that I use in the Sherpa coaching process is called Support Mountain. Here's two questions that I ask. It, it's a whole lot deeper than this. We're just scratching the surface. What do I do for myself and who has my back? What do I do for myself and who has my back? In order to make behavioral changes in our lives, we have to be able to answer those two questions. My clients who say, well, I don't do a lot for myself. Okay, there's where we start. And then if nobody at work has their back, we'll confront them with truth when they need it, or we'll support them when they need it. People who have your back. If you don't have those in your life, you're in trouble. And so this becomes a key strategy at the beginning of the coaching relationship because the changes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help somebody make need this kind of support. Have to have it. It was Coach Tom Keefe at the University of Cincinnati, also a lawyer. Some of you may know him. Uh, Tom was an assistant coach at UC when I was swimming there. And uh, he taught me about Support Mountain, although he didn't call it that. I was having a uh, difficult uh, year during my sophomore year. Things were not going well in the pool. The body was falling apart. <laughs> in fact, that was my last season as I blew out the shoulder and uh, surgery. Uh, I just chose not to come back from that. And uh, I, re I remember very vividly hopping out of practice, right in the middle of practice, <laughs> grabbing my stuff and stomping, if you can, uh, with my towel toward the locker room. And Tom yelling my name. <laughs> we actually had a deaf swimmer on the team, and he goes, I know that's not her. <laughs> he told me later. And we sat down on the bench, and he said, what have you done for yourself lately? What do you do for you? Well, in the translation of a sophomore athlete, college athlete, I started getting a pint of UDF ice cream every day <laughs> as my response to do something for myself. And it was wonderful. It made all the difference in the world when it was okay for me to be a priority. Huge difference. Here's the last thing I'll share with you. It's in your notes. It may not be super clear, but again, if you'll email me, I'll be glad to give you this whole presentation. The health life wheel. Here's the assignment. To rate yourself one to 10 in these seven categories. Faith life, movement or exercise, Everybody see where that slide is? Medical, how's your physical health? What about work? How's your emotional state, your emotional health? What about nutrition? How well do you eat? And what about friends and family? How would you rate yourself in each of those categories? How well are you doing? But Here's, here's the real question, because it's a balance. The real question is, does the wheel roll? Does the wheel roll? Let me give you an example. If I have sevens and eights, faith, life, movement, medical maybe is at a five or six, works at an eight, Emotional's a five or a six, nutrition's at a seven. You know, so pretty much they're all in that range, but all of a sudden friends and family are a two. My wheel is not gonna roll. In fact, it's gonna get stuck on that side. This is what happens in our lives when we don't manage stress and bring balance to our lives. Does your wheel roll. I 
challenge you to use this and evaluate yourself. See where you are, be honest. So we've had a free coaching session drawing. I look forward to Jan, make sure we don't uh, leave. If you, and if you have to leave, take one of my cards and just email me. Uh, but uh, if anyone would be interested in, in uh, doing some more uh, in the coaching realm, if you contact me in the next 10 days, I will just lower that cost significantly for you uh, and uh, explain to you kind of what we do. One-on-one -on -one is 12 sessions, an hour at a time, and there's also team coaching that I do around communication and DISC and expectations and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of questions do you have? What kind of things do you want to know more about or go back to if I skipped over too quickly, you were taking notes? Yes, sir. Okay. Excellent. That's right. You're the only one you can control. Yeah. Oh, yes. Huge. Thank you. Uh-huh. No. The thing, I, the thing I would tell you, the best way to help communication happen and avoid assumptions. Assumptions are the nail in the coffin of communication. And we all do it. So whenever somebody is saying something, ask them the question, could you say more about that? And then just sit back and let them really ask what they're asking. Because rarely do we ask what we want to know in the first time around. Could you say more about that? It's a, it's a great strategy to help communication happen. Yes, sir? On your, on your balance wheel, you talked about people with the ranking of six or seven, and you can go all the way up to 10. How much joy is there in someone making the movement in every area of that balance wheel from six in the direction of 10? Now, they may not get there, but is that, is that one of the things that you try to do in your coaching to encourage people to make positive change in all those areas? Correct. Movement is the, is the criteria for measuring it. Has there been movement? Uh, have you moved? You, you, don't have to, you don't have to go from a 5 to a 10, but if you go from a 5 to a 6 and somebody else goes from an 8 to a 9, the 5 to a 6 has made a bigger jump. Um, so, yeah, absolute great joy in doing that. Um, one, one way to, to think about it in, in a whole other context that may help some people, in, in my pastor profession, I, I'm big on helping people serve. Well, whether they serve locally, nationally, or globally, I don't really care. <laughs> serve. Make a move towards serving. So yeah, so it's not necessarily about the 10, it's about the balance. Awesome. What else? Yes, ma'am. S's. S's are um, S's need to, need to make decisions more quickly because S's don't like to make decisions because they don't, they don't like conflict with people. They don't want people to disagree with them. So S's tend to sit back and just go with the crowd. Um, and and, and what, a lot of what I work on with S's is, is quicker decisions. S's also are the, the, of the four profiles that make more assumptions than anybody else. When I ask an S a question, I have to remember the S thinks I have the answer to it. And they're trying, they don't want to answer because they want to get the right answer. I don't have an answer. It's a question. And that's where the assumption thing can come in with the S. There was one over here yes. first. 
What is your email address? It's kind of hard to, a little to hard see to read. in here. There is a business card out on the table. Uh, it's level up coach four, the number four, and the letter U at gmail.com. But pick up a card right behind the wall here. Um, or if it, it may be able to find it on the, uh, if you can read, level up coach number four, letter U at gmail.com. I'm a C. Yes, sir. What are your resources? <laughs> Say more about that. Seriously. Seriously. Say, say more. I'm not. I would like to know what other resources you might recommend for me to consider before, because I'm still aiming. Still aiming. Uh, so uh, if you remember the circle, the D's and the I's are at the top, the C's and the S's are at the bottom. So part of it is getting C's to make decisions. Uh, so we actually have a whole tool called Decision Making Mountain that is a process for making better decisions and making them more quickly. Um, uh, C's uh, really need to hang on to the Q-tip because if, if we were to walk out to your car and I were to see some fluid draining from the front of your car and I were to say, hey, uh, Ken, there's, there's something dripping under your car, you'd say, oh my gosh, thank you so much. But if I was sitting in a presentation and after the presentation, I said, hey, Ken, uh, there was a hole in your presentation, I think. <laughs> All of a sudden, the C tends to take that more personally. Now, as we age, we hopefully mature with some of that. Uh, but making decisions and not taking them personally, uh, not taking things personally are two huge things for a C to move forward with. What I was asking for resources. Like a book? See, I didn't ask the question again. Still say more to me. I thought I knew what he had, was asking. Great illustration. Um, there's a book out called, is it Leading with Questions? Leading by Questions? Leading with Questions? Something like that. Uh, it's about leadership and asking great questions. Um, C's tend to ask lots of questions, but not necessarily the, the best questions. And so that might be, and I, I apologize, I, don't, I, don't, I can't grab the name of the book, but leading with questions, by questions. <laughs> Email me and I'll, uh, and I'll find it, yeah. And I'll be glad to add some more to that. I've got a good database. I'll send you some articles that uh, kind of go to that C. Be glad to. Anything else? I'll certainly be glad to stick around, but yes, yes, ma'am. Um, you mentioned at the, the very beginning that this is, that DISC is about behavior, which is different than personality. And yes. personality can't be changed, but behavior can. So I'm sure you could talk for hours on it, but I'm wondering if you can just give a little bit about how this DISC model might interact with something like a Myers-Briggs, which tests your personality type that right. has some of these similar traits and might lead your behavior in a certain right. direction. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of study done on Myers-Briggs and DISC, and they do not mesh. Um, there is one profile on the DISC that does mesh with a certain profile on, on Myers-Briggs, but literally it's only one connection point. Um, Myers-Briggs, you, you can be an introvert or an extrovert in any of these pro, DISC profiles. Um, does a D and an I, you're probably not gonna find an I who's an introvert, because they, they like lots of people. Um, you probably, most Ds are gonna be extroverts. Uh, Ss probably have a tendency to be an introvert, but they also make some of the best leaders, so it doesn't really matter does that, I don't know if that, does that get at your question? There's just not a lot of, of intersection between the two things. Mm -hmm. Yep, very much so. Yeah. And, and probably letters, yes. Whole profiles, no, in the Myers-Briggs, yes. A little more, little more intersection with those. That's good clarification. I saw another hand somewhere, I thought. Maybe not. I got these right. The cautious and 
I just wanted to make sure I got these right. The cautious and questioning is a C? Cautious, questioning. Cautious at the bottom, questioning on the left is a C. Correct. Thank you. And she's probably a C because she wanted to be exact about it. You're an I. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I'll be glad to stick around. Uh, I know we're, uh, we're right, at, uh, right at 1 o'clock and uh, chat with anybody if you'd like to. Business cards are out there on a table, but seriously, email me if you want the uh, presentation. I'll be glad to send it to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate being here.